to Why the Cast Man, a podcast. Why the Cast why Man? Why the Cast Man? Why? Why? Come on. Tell us why already. This is a podcast about Why the Last Man on FX on Hulu. We're going to be talking about Season 1, Episode 7, My Mother Saw a Monkey. So if you haven't checked that out, please do. Also, I'm Alex. I forgot to say that earlier. My mother saw a monkey, and I'm Justin. <laughs> Ooh, we should play that. Did you ever play that game when you were in like uh, elementary school? My mother saw a monkey. You go around. Everybody says their names. They say, my name is Alex, and my mother saw a monkey. And then the next person says, my name is Justin. My mother saw a monkey and a, uh, and then you add something, and everybody has to remember it. And then you make out in the closet, right? Sorry, I forget exactly how yes. all of my childhood games. <laughs> that was seven minutes in hell, I believe, because yeah. kissing, yuck. Seven minutes with monkey. Will you make out with a monkey <laughs> seven for seven minutes, minutes in the closet? my mother? Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, that's little. what I played. I played that just last week. And see, I'll see you later. <laughs> I'm going to see myself out. <laughs> in any case, go watch the episode on FX on Hulu if you haven't, because we're going to spoil it, but a broad overview of what happens in this episode. 355 crashes her little camper truck, leaving Allison and Yorick stranded while Yorick recuperates with a community mostly made up of prison escapees, 355 mm -hmm. and Allison are locked up and sort of suss out their relationship a little bit. But by the end of the episode, Yorick has gotten them free. 355 is recovering. And Yorick has struck up a flirtation, seemingly, with one of the women who lives there. So, yes, I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I think everybody, including 355, is pretty concerned about that. Meanwhile, on the Washington side of things, even more concerning things are happening as Kimber and Regina, thanks to the soldiers that Yorick and 355 let live last episode, find out that most likely Yorick is alive, Ampersand is alive. They decide to use that information against Jennifer because Kimber's mother accidentally blabbed that, as well as many other circumstances. She ends up, uh, very sadly, killing herself by the end of the episode. Jennifer, yeah. meanwhile, is very busy the entire episode because Beth comes to Washington. Beth comes back wearing a very cool coat. And Yes, a <laughs> stressful coat. Very Every time stressful. I kept seeing it, it was like, that sums Ugh. up with that coat. Oh, my gosh. And uh, ultimately, it turns out that Beth is working for an organization that most likely spells real bad things for Jennifer in particular and Washington in general. So lots to talk about here, but I want to get this out of the way first. Uh, continuing my turnaround on the show, I thought this episode was great. Really good. Now, I'm... I'm curious. I agree. I really like yeah. this episode. I'm curious what the changeover has been for you because you came into this show sort of like, mm, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a little burnt out on this type of show. And it feels like you've really uh, changed. Have you changed? Has the show changed? Uh, walk me through your thinking. Have you had a, some sort of psychic, psychotic break? Um, <laughs> are you like, tell me what's uh, mm -hmm. going on? Uh, yeah, I've gone through a lot of life experiences <laughs> lately uh, that I'm going to lay out in graphic detail at this point. No, I, I think, uh, like we've been talking about, all of the elements have been slowly falling into place. And uh, first of all, I think I'm always a big fan of a show that figures itself out as it goes on. Mm -hmm. There's, which happens, it feels like very rarely nowadays because so many things are planned in advance and filmed in advance and don't necessarily get the feedback from the audience of a weekly broadcast show that's going to go 22 episodes or something like that. They often feel very even across the board, like either they got it right in the first episode or they don't have it, and that's it. So to see something that was filmed and planned in advance like this, but clearly took its time in the writer's room to figure out the characters, what was going on, what was happening, what the situation is, it, it took a while to get, in particular, to the sense of fun and adventure that was present in the comic, but that really feels full force here. And I'll give at least a little bit of the credit to this episode, To It was written by Charlie Jade Anders, who famously, I believe, is from io9 and other places and really knows like the comic book space mm. in particular. So I imagine is well aware of why The Last Man is the comic book and where some of the other writers might be going for, okay, we're going for this apocalypse vibe. This is what we're doing. We're not really worrying about what's in the comic. I think Charlie has a sense of it and really infuses Yorick the right way, Allison the right way, 355 the right way. And the stuff in Washington, which has been this simmer really starts to explode this episode in a big way. And it's very tense across the board. Yeah. I mean, I agree. And I think maybe um, 
it feels like this episode did maybe the best job of balancing the storylines and sort of be jumping back and forth between each one in a way that was really effective, especially since the show sort of wasn't doing that. It was very much like we're doing this, these two storylines and we're going to sort of, they're divorced from each other and we're just moving. When this, it felt like they were sort of speaking to each other uh, thematically or tonally or something like that over the course of the episode. One thing I think we talked about in... I want to say it was the third episode or maybe the fourth episode was the sense of geography of the show, which I felt like was a little unclear. What does it matter about that to me in this episode is you really get this sense of a chase that's about to kick off that wherever Yorick and 355 and Allison are, the forces in Washington are essentially like right behind them. So even though they're not physically there, it feels mentally like they're there. And that creates a tension that wasn't necessarily present at the beginning. Well, and I think that that sort of speaks to the comic book, I think did a good job of that. The whole world was after Yorick because he's the last man. And I think the the show starting to be like, it doesn't matter what's going on. He's still the only one, except for the monkey. And uh, there, the world is going to come crashing on his shores no matter how happy, sad, uh, scared he is, wherever he is. But I do think uh, on the tip of you starting to like the show more, I think the show is a little bit of a victim of circumstance in two ways. One, just our general Walking Dead-style apocalypse burnout that I think we are all a part of it's like in mm-hmm. some of that in this episode I why think. just because there's three walking dead shows out at the same time and i have to watch all of them for work not quite sure what you're talking about there justin but go ahead yeah you seem totally normal when it yeah, comes I'm to great. i saw I'm you great. i saw you jam a steak into someone's uh, almost through someone's living head at the grocery store the other day i mean they opened their mouth and it looked like they were gonna bite me so what was i supposed to do i think you acted in the right and i think the uh the court case the pending court case will bear that out <laughs> Um, And the other circumstance is just like COVID and everything we've been through. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot of that real life tension that we have coming into the show. We're like, nah, this is stressful at the top. But once we're past that sort of premise tension and stress and into the characters, it really starts to work. um, And I think that's why you have uh, finally gotten on board. I'm immune to that because I don't see anything happening in the world as anything but a fictional story that I'm living through. Yeah, you're the protagonist, right? That's exactly. Thank you for finally oh, saying yeah. that. No problem. I'm barely, I'm rarely recognized as the protagonist outside of my own brain. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think what you're saying, though, is brought to bear really nicely in the very first scene of the episode where we're reminded oh, yeah, there's dead people littered literally everywhere. They're rotting, their corpses are, you know, petrified by this point because it's been several months down the road. But it's. That is side to Ampersand pushing a ball. What's going on with Allison and Yurik? The very funny exchange they have where they're like, oh, God, we got to get it back in 355's good graces. And uh, Yurik is like, wow, that's smart. What a good idea, 355. She's like, very oh, fun. shut up. Shut up and leave me alone. And it, that's the dynamic that you want to see is like this, the first couple of episodes, and then I think we can move beyond it. The first couple of episodes are the pandemic the plague was at the forefront here now it's the background it's the tapestry it's the thing that drives all of them and it's omnipresent but it's not the most important thing yeah i think that's right and to your point about the dynamic it is funny it's sort of the beginning of this episode has like a three stooges vibe if one of the stooges was an ice cold killer uh <laughs> Uh, because you got uh, Dr. Man Curly, and York right? being... Curly, Yeah, you... oh, that, exactly. He, think about the ass. name. Mm-hmm. First off, Curly, he was bald. That's yeah. fucked up. It's Psychotic. fucked up off the gate. Psychotic. This person's crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, but to have them be sort of like goofy and fun throughout, and then 355 is just like uh, fully um, iced over and clearly dealing with... Uh, a bunch of problems here Mm -hmm. gets them almost all killed. uh, And it was completely her fault. Yeah. Uh, Later on in the episode, one of the absolute best exchanges as well is the whole thing around the shoelace where three, five, five is in prison, removes her shoelace. Allison is like, what are you going to do with a shoelace? And that pays off really nicely when Yorick comes up to her and says, Hey, you're in no shape to fight anybody, so I'm going to fight you, which is already a bad idea. Even if she's sick, you're yeah. not going to take down 355. But I think the line is something like, I'm gonna, are you ready for me to beat your ass with a shoelace? Which is very funny, and then she does. Yeah. Um, but it also, like we're saying, ties in really nicely emotionally, because 
she collapses after that. And they do have to take care of her, leading to a very emotionally charged line towards the end of the episode where she's in bed, she's recuperating, and she says, you won't have to do this again. You won't have to take care of me again, which... We still don't know exactly what's going on with 355, but I think that's a very big clue in terms of whatever trauma she experienced. Ugh. Well, we get there's because I think that was, that's an essential question here. I mean, earlier episodes, she was sort of sleepwalking, but now she's uh, sleep. She's wide awake and sleep driving. Mm -hmm. which is a bad that's a bad combination. Um, I'm not a doctor, but just yeah. a quick diagnosis. I did that once. It was pretty bad. Yeah, no, it's definitely not scary. a joke, actually. I was you... just real quick personal story. So it was Great. in college. We were at a comedy gig, I, th I think in Pennsylvania or something like that. And I had to drive back to upstate New York. Um, and I was like, oh, I didn't drink at all tonight, so I can drive. That's fine. And everybody else was like, great, no problem. Uh, maybe we can switch off over the course of the night because it's a very long drive and exhausting. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. So I started driving. Immediately, everybody else had been drinking and completely fell asleep and was asleep in the car. And I started to do exactly what 355 did with just my eyes rolling back in my head and my lids falling down. And I started swerving a little bit. Luckily, the road was empty, but I was like, oh, no, this is really bad. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. There's a there's a rest stop right here. I'm going to stop at this rest stop, just close my eyes for like an hour, and hopefully somebody will wake up or we'll see what happens. And so I parked at the rest stop, slept for like an hour, woke up, everybody was still asleep, drove all the way home, and when I pulled up, I turned back to look at everybody, and then I woke up again because I had actually dreamt the entire drive home. And at that point, wow. I had just been asleep for several hours. Also, nobody had woken up, and we were just very late for what we <laughs> to do. Oh, my God. That's yeah. trippy. Yeah. It's pretty uh, weird. I love that you dreamt. You're like, well, I'll just drive the rest of the way home in dream. <laughs> yeah. Real boring. Real boring. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I really felt 355 in the moment uh, because I had experienced almost a similar thing. And you turned to all of them and said, you'll never have to take care of me again. Mm -hmm. And they were like, sorry, we're drunk sleeping. We, don't, we can't hear you right now. <laughs> yeah, stay away from that girl, by the way, is the other thing that I said. Yeah, yeah good. Stop. Break up with all your girlfriends, guys. We have to dedicate our lives to comedy, mm -hmm. which is our version of getting York to San Francisco. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, why the last man standing? Sketch group? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, what do you think is going on with 355 at this point? Because like you were saying, we do have that view of the car crash in her dream as well. Yeah, so uh, clearly it feels like they're they're pointing towards some sort of childhood trauma here. Um, but that's something that we've seen in other shows. I feel like it's going to be larger than that. I think there's something with um, – we mentioned this before. She's There's some programming perhaps involved with her training at, at the Culper Ring. And maybe they use a childhood trauma as a way of – sort of getting them into sort of a killer state or a way that they can move beyond their emotions and just do what needs to be done, which is what 355 seems like she does all the time. She doesn't mm -hmm. really deal with anything besides the mission. So I think maybe the trauma resurfacing is something with like, if she doesn't get her, her programming or brainwashing, whatever you want to call it, re-upped at a certain amount of time, it starts to disintegrate. And she's struggling with that right now. Yeah, she definitely needs to sleep at the very least because that part was really stressing me out. <laughs> Just well, clearly, that's your trauma. Yes, one hundred percent. It really did. I I don't like it at all. I'm like, please just sleep for a couple of hours. Just take a rest. Come on, it's okay. They're going to be just fine. Maybe I mean, this is not. still part of your dream, and you're just sleeping beside the road at that rest stop. Oh my god, that would be legitimately the worst thing if you dreamt for several decades and woke up and you're like, huh. Oh. Yeah, and like, oh, shit, I got to go do all that stuff I just dreamed now? Yeah. Well, at least you know what's going to happen, so you can do it differently, I guess. <sighs> and That's at least it. this time, maybe I'll have... <laughs> yeah, I really am very stressed out talking about this. Uh, le... <laughs> Uh, talk about trauma. I, anyway, that that's my theory on 355. Yeah, I think that's a pretty and fair you. theory. I uh, Let's turn and talk about Yorick a little bit in this episode and what's going on with him as well as the lady prison. Really like this group, and I really like the dynamic of this group. I know we've referenced Walking Dead every single episode here, but this almost feels like an anti-Walking Dead group. I wrote the same note down. I was like, yeah. this is reverse Walking Dead. They seem too nice, and maybe they just are. <laughs> right. Though, I, it, and it plays, I mean, everything's there. There's great barbecue. 
There's a, mm-hmm. they seem to be brewing their own beer, which I was like very curious what that is. They have a lovely brunch as Yorick gets behind toast. I'm a huge toast guy, so great to see it. Uh, and one of the things that will vanish in an apocalypse. Yeah, that's even the if first we make thing bread. Yes, exactly. That's why I'm always got my eyes. Watch the toast. They say. So Watch let's talk toast. about this woman though that takes off all of his clothes and sleeps next to him. First of all. I assume this is going to happen every couple of episodes is Yorick is just going to end up completely nude somehow and have to go find pants. Yeah. That's how I've uh, gauged the episodes of my life. Mm-hmm. And, now, well, I do have a question about that, yeah. actually. Um, when Yorick gets up out of the bed, he has a pillow over his um, his uh, penis, <laughs> and then he has another right. pillow over his uh, <laughs> over his butt. Okay. Which I was like, I understand why they do that for television. But mm-hmm. whenever you're naked and you're like need to suddenly hide, do you put a pillow over your butt? I'm not concerned about my butt. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, you put it over the front, and then you kind of shuffle, you crab shuffle a little bit, so that nobody can see you're behind. But yes, you got to do that for television, and also it makes it more awkward if he's holding two pillows on his body. Yeah, you need a free when you're naked. You need at least one free hand. Is a rule mm-hmm. I live by. And Absolutely. Yorick again, he's not good at anything but being a man in the uh, post male apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Both hands occupied. Bad business. Yeah. And plus, who wants those pillows after? Puts their face on those pillows after he's using them as genital coverings. Come on. I think pretty bad things are coming for this community, though, which they tease pretty heavily towards the end of the episode. I think they are nice, but ultimately it's going to end up getting wrecked because of whatever happens with Yorick there. He'll probably feel some guilt about that. But also, this is getting into spoilers from the comics, but I think he's going to sleep with this woman and then feel awful about it, right? Well, especially we have the reemergence of Beth in this episode, and mm-hmm. uh, some things change with her, obviously. We can talk about what we think in a minute. But to have him maybe having a flirtation at the same time Beth comes back, it's like when you, in, uh, when you just start dating someone and you bump into your ex, you're like, ah, mm-hmm. oh, come on. I just, <laughs> I just I got out of this hole, now I got to see you. Um, so I think, I think that's not a coincidence from the overall story of the series. Um, I also not to to say they're a hundred percent nice. Um, this community they're in, maybe, but there's the looks that the leader was giving made me think that maybe they want Yorick to sleep with this woman to maybe impregnate her. Mm-hmm. I think I that's, thought it was something. Yeah, that's fair, and that's something that ties over into the Washington storyline and what Kimber is talking about as well. Certainly, certainly, I think this woman likes Yorick. And he is yes. charming in this episode. We talked about how some of the dialogue was not funny, but he clearly comes off self-facing and funny in the right Yorick way in this episode. So I think she does like him. But yes, there's definitely at least a little bit of an ulterior motive because whatever community has the last man is in a good position going forward. You know, whether it is restarting civilization, whether it's just having a living sex tool to be, you know, blunt about it. Sex tool? Uh, yeah, come on. You know, living sex tool. You know what I'm talking about. I Yeah, I guess I do. I guess I do. That's my nickname around the house here, so I definitely get it. And I can't believe you used that so publicly. Yeah, sorry, and thanks for sharing. No, but hey, now, you, York, I feel like, has to judge, does she really like me mm-hmm. here? Because he is the last man. It's like there's only one slice of pizza left. You'd be like... It's good. That was Brian K. Vaughn's original idea, actually, was one yeah. last slice of pizza left on Earth. Everybody's after yeah. it. Slice, the last pizza, <laughs> was what it was called. <laughs> but I like this dynamic. It's clearly head for doom, even though we get a fun episode here. But I, I think this is nice, and I'm excited to see this all probably completely fall apart next episode. Why don't we move over to the Washington stuff, because there's so much to dig into there. Um I don't, honestly, I don't even know where to start. Uh, I think we talked about this a lot, but uh, we get another great scene of Jennifer playing both sides really well here when she's talking well, I, to these soldiers. You I this. love that scene, yeah, because she has to deny this so hard. Well, also, she's overjoyed. It's, there's no way it's not Yorick with ampersand. Like, the monkey's a big litmus test. Like, if you have a pet monkey, people are you can't hide. Mm-hmm. Just remember that. Or any sort of pet that lives on your shoulder. Right. A bird, cat. There's a lot of people that walk around. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of people. Probably. That's how you identify <laughs> pirates. 
<laughs> well, 100%. And, and a in New York, I mean, just to jump back to the cat thing, I, I don't know if they're out there. I haven't been out to Union Square very much recently, but there are dudes who walk around with cats on their heads. This is not a joke for anybody listening. It's, guys, this is not a joke. We it's joke about a lot of things, but serious. this is the fucking serious. This is something we take seriously. Yeah. There are cat hat people in, in New York City walking around. The cat yeah. hats. Yeah. And you should uh, listen to our other podcast, Why the Cat Bad. Which is <laughs> yeah, why the cat, man? Why the cat, that's what man? I would, that's what I say. Um, but I, I do love the way that Diane Lane plays this and this, the position she keeps getting put in. Um, it happens multiple times in this, in this episode. That moment where she has to deny the that York's there while also being excited, and I like that we don't even we just know it. Mm -hmm. She never talks about it. She's just playing it cool with her assistant Christine. And then the other moment is when she sees Beth, and she's like. So happy to see her. The best, like, sort of like, uh, okay, I'm just your uh, son's, assuming dead son's ex, basically. And she's so happy. And you can tell she wants to tell her that York's alive. Don't worry. But she doesn't. And I yeah. thought that was really well. Done. I really thought she was going to. Honestly, Me too. I'm Me glad too. she didn't, given what we find out at the end of the episode. But it really felt like she was on the edge there. So they played that tension really nicely. Uh, there was another moment jumping over to Kimber for a second that I thought was really nice. And I felt like I know they I know they didn't film this in the week since we uh, put up the last podcast, but I appreciated Kimber responding directly to our podcast when they're talking about the aid to Jennifer. And she says her name is Kristen and she's pregnant because they haven't, I think, said her name out loud at all before this. Mostly, so that was I nice. think I somehow knew it, so that someone must have said okay. it. I keep calling her Christine, so maybe I'm also wrong. But well, maybe it is Christine. Close. It's Christine, actually. Uh, yeah, you're right. Christine, great. Um, so I, they they have, but I I agree with you. It was like this story is important. Maybe <laughs> <That's> what <laughs> she was sort of saying there. Um, and to talk about Kimber across the board, I feel like we've talked about her as this um, conservative stand-in for like Meghan McCain, other people. And how she goes back and forth between being like unlikable and sort of like uh, causing a problem for her own political ends and sort of likable, um, like uh, has the tragedy of her family, losing her family, her sons, and trying to take care of Christine. In this episode, that pot boiled the fuck over and she became fully like, oh, she's a problem here yeah. and someone who is like pretty unhinged. I mean, obviously, a lot of bad things happened to her in this episode. But over the course of it, she sort of sheds all that sort of middle of the road and is like, we need to destroy this shit. It's time to take this seriously, which I was very surprised we got rid of all of that. I loved the turn there because it felt like Regina comes in. She's the one who's going to muck things up. She's going to mess things up for Jennifer, like she's been doing. She's kind of been pushing on it a little bit. She's our big bad of the season, at least in terms of the Washington storyline. And in this episode, Kimber screaming at her. You can tell yeah. Regina is terrified yes. of Kimber. Like yeah. the power dynamic completely flips between them. And I thought that was so unexpected and so amazing to see. Plus, just the speech i don't know if i even wrote down any of it but her basically being like no we can go back to being mothers and uh sisters and again just that this is what she wants and just stating her motivation so clearly she's clearly in the wrong like she clearly you can't get back even if they were able to repopulate the earth with men right it's still going to be decades Things are not going to be the same again. Things will have changed, so she's never going to get that world back. But the fact that she so effectively has been like, nope, this is what we're doing. You get in line, Regina. Get in line behind me is was stunning. And it'll be well, interesting I, to see what happens given what happens at the end of the episode, of course. Yeah, um, I agree with you. It was such a great turnaround, and it sort of shows how they've been sort of slow playing um, the sort of her keeping all the uh, toys in her purse and stuff as like setting up this delusion that she has because she instantly becomes the, the most delusional here in maybe in the show mm -hmm. where she's like, like you said, going to go back instantly and as if they capture Yorick and immediately um, <laughs> have either have sex with him or somehow um, <laughs> get impregnated by him and then they have kids and then the kids don't die from the disease. Like She's making a lot of assumptions to try to get back to this vision she has. And I thought that was especially interesting 
that she has this delusion and is like, I'm going to make this happen. And then her mom, who is like, everyone's like, she's crazy. And she's like, let's go live and we'll eat, feed off the land on the apple trees. And Kimber instantly shatters that delusion without mm-hmm. any care, despite the fact that she is pushing her delusion. So like in the the lack of empathy she has there for her mom, and that is part of what pushes her mom over her ed, over the edge and – I think, at least the way the episode mm-hmm. is built. So the whole thing, like, I thought was so nuanced, but also so, like, just turned all the way up to the top. It was a huge turn for the for the character and the Washington power dynamic. Yeah. Obviously, it's a awful, awful thing that happens at the end of the episode with Kimber's mom. I did appreciate that they put up the uh, suicide helpline number there at the end as well. I know legally at this point they have to do it, but uh, I think you could have gone both ways with the episode so it's good to throw it in there regardless but yeah. the one little quibble that i have one little question i have mm. kimber at the end runs into that hallway falls down screams can she see her mom's body anywhere because it seems like i don't know where she was in relationship to that i don't think she was near the body i think she was just it was all hitting her from just reading the note but the way it was shot, it did feel like the bot, the camera was pulling out to reveal the body right there, but they were inside, so it clearly yeah. wasn't. Um, I wonder if I think there that was a was shot just... there and they realized that it would have been potentially inappropriate to show the body that way, given the messaging at the end. It, that could be. It felt, me, it felt to me like it just – the anticipation of the mm-hmm. way the progression of the scene was built that they were going to end up showing the body – um, but I, I just don't think the geography of the building makes sense because she was right. in like a hallway. It's not like that hallway yeah. opened to uh, the outside. So yeah. like I, I think it was just sort of a the the dread and the the what she was feeling was so present because she knew what was happening mm-hmm. uh, less than her seeing the actual body land or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And it's fine. You know what's happening anyway. It was just a weird, again, bit of geography that kind of threw me a little bit there at the end of the episode. Before we wrap up here, we definitely should talk about Beth and what's going on with Beth, though. First of all, huge surprise to see her back in this episode yeah. at all because she is off screen the large majority of the run of the comic book right up until the last run of issues. And at that point, I believe she's in Australia, right? So yeah. So clearly something different happened here. We don't have a lot of information about it. She's part of this group. There's definitely some gaps we need to fill in here in terms of the information. But what did you think about this turn with Beth and what do you think is going on with her? Uh, Well, clearly, uh, I mean, when she first comes in, I was like, oh, this is nice. I thought this her uh, finding President Brown was going to be about York and about her revealing and seeing what setting her on a mission. But then as it went on and we she takes a shower and she's like, I'm just going to go live with my friend. I was like, that's not real. There's no way the friend has like a nice spot by the lake or whatever. So I was suddenly like, Oh, she's lying there. I wonder what the deal is. And then you sort of see that she has this like veneer over her, um, the whole time. And then when she gets back outside and she meets with a group in the back of the van, it's like, Oh, she has somehow been radicalized. Maybe it's conspiracy theory. Like she's there to take down the president who they blame for the, the plague. That all feels very present. And I thought maybe, does this relate back to um, the Amazon group where Nora and and Hero is? I feel like you could draw a connection there, um, potentially, or or on a whole new threat entirely. If anything, I would throw out that it's probably connected in some way to the protesters we saw in the third episode, I believe. Maybe fourth episode. Um, I keep mixing them up. But to your point... I would guess it's not the Amazons. It's some organization that's saying, no, government shouldn't exist anymore. Bring down all the governments. They're invalid. They're unnecessary. We're in a new world now. So let's even things out. But that comes through to me in the way that Beth is talking about. It's like another time inside there. It's like a time capsule. Um, right. And they're all dressed up. Everything's clean. I don't think they want to live there. I think they want to bring it to its knees. And it'll be yeah. interesting to see how that clashes in particular with what Kimber and Regina have going on because they want to bring things backwards. Jennifer wants to slowly move things forwards. And it seems to me that Beth's group wants to wipe it all out and start again. Some sort of anarchist mm-hmm. situation here. Yeah, a whole V um, for Vendetta type thing. Oh, nice. That'll be fun. 
if mm-hmm. it's crossover potential. Oh, man. Bring in all right. of the Vertigo comic books. That would be great. Mm. You get V for yeah. Vendetta. <laughs> Difficult crossover <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. to really maintain. I also thought it was interesting the moment where um, Beth is uh, in the first conversation maybe they have. And uh, Beth wandered. She got back to the city after she was out of the city. And she went to their apartment and didn't go in. If she had gone in, she would have seen York there waiting yeah. for her. And um, it would be a whole different story. So I thought that was a cool little like... Unless she's lying is the other possibility there because it was weird that she was talking about, yeah, I was just riding around on my bike when it all happened because wasn't she supposed to be on a plane to Australia at that point? So I I sort of feel like something else happened there and we don't exactly know what it is, but I think we'll find out. I think we'll get some sort of flashback to Beth's time would be my guess. Yeah, I bet we'll find out uh, real soon. And then I think we're owed another uh, Nora hero um, session next episode as well. Yeah, absolutely. One last thing I wanted to call out about this. I like that uh, Jennifer's go-to move is giving people spaghetti when she comes over to her house. She did that for Yorick and does the same thing for Beth. Easy dish to prepare. You know, it's just mm-hmm. a couple minutes. Perfectly all cooked al dente. And mm-hmm. noodles, even in the apocalypse, you wanna, don't want to overcook your noodles. As everybody knows, if you want spaghetti with sauce or testosterone, you've got to go to the president of the United States. Yes, exactly. The, there's a strategic reserve of ragu beneath the White House, <laughs> as we all we all know that. Yeah, That's, no I'm need, not crazy. No need to explain. Before we wrap up here, who was the man? Who's the man in this week's episode, Justin? Um, well, you know... Uh, in this, like I said, this show, this episode is so balanced between the different storylines. It was hard. It's hard for me to pick. A, like, oh, this was definitely the best uh, situation running. But um, I got to give it up for uh, Kimber and and her storyline. I really think that heel turn uh, moment uh, was wild, and the way that the small play, the nuanced uh, performance um, that we've got so far, spins into this whole storm. I thought was really cool. Yeah, I'd definitely go for her as well. But as a close second, I'll actually throw it out to Yorick this episode, just because I think this was the right Yorick. This is the Yorick we know from the books. He was playing it the right way. He was, like I said earlier, charming, self-effacing, actually taking some action and working with people. Um, Doing some magic, some light escape work. Exactly. But I liked watching him in this episode, and it's been a slow burn in terms of, God, this guy's really annoying, to actually ingratiatingly liking him which maybe that was part of the point maybe that's what they were going for all along is yep. take seven episodes but we finally like the main character on the show if you'd like to support this podcast patreon.com slash comic book club also we do a live show every tuesday night at 7 p.m to crowdcast and youtube come hang out we'd love to chat with you about why the last man itunes android spotify stitcher or the app of your choice to subscribe listen and follow the show at comic book live on twitter comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, why the cast, man? Why the cast, man? Alex, wake up. Wake up. (gasps) You have to finish driving. Oh, no. I got to get everybody home.